Hello everybody, I'd like to talk this today about poplars and willows as you can see and I'd like you to think during my presentation about landscapes. I'm going to be talking about particularly about poplars and willows and two other species but if you think about where they fit in the landscape and perhaps a little beyond that and how you might influence that if you're a landowner and how if you're a beekeeper or have other, some, some other influence on landowners just how you might be able to help that happen. And uh, there's a good example of, a, of a, what I would call a pretty resilient landscape uh, could use a few more trees. In the very dark writing at the bottom there, it's, it says, uh, with a focus on East Coast Hill Country, because I wanted to, to be relevant to where most of you are probably familiar with, and uh, that's, of course, where I've been working for 28 years. I'd just like to acknowledge also some of the tremendous work done by Mike Martin and uh, for 30-odd years and his team, um, based here and in Palmerston North and other parts of the country, who've worked throughout the East Coast, right down through the Wairarapa, and put figures on data and data on knowledge that we thought we already had, but they've also come up with knowledge that we didn't have. And it's made a huge difference in talking with farmers about what to do with their landscapes and how to manage them. You've also got the, currently it's the pop, led by the Poplar and Willow Trust, which Bruce is on the board, and the uh, Ian McIver is the scientist, breeding again, thank goodness, more momentum, building poplars and willow uh, gene pools again that we can use out there and add to the gene pools that we already have. And the years and years of research that went prior to that, Bob Hathaway and Chris Van Cranord who just recently passed away, huge, huge uh, amount of um, gratitude to those people. And then there's the farmers who've done all the, particularly the enthusiasts who've done all the work out on the farms and trialled new varieties, I've seen Nicky, he's one of them, and tried all sorts of things that we've been able to learn from and advise other farmers on. Right, we'll move on. That's uh, Kawa Poplar, by the way, on that hillside. This is a local farm, and that's Ray Newman. Uh, to his credit, he has planted a very steep hillside and given himself permanent access through that hillside there. And it's not far away from here. So why poplars and willows? Firstly, they're easy to grow in the nursery, and I'll be honest with you, that is one of the very <laughs> first things that used to be thought about when growing poplars and willows for, for the landscape, because if they couldn't be propagated easily, then of course you had to think of some, some other way of doing it. Now that's a perfect example, I have to say, and not every nursery looks like that. So there's a bit of weed control, a bit of rust control, pruning, and of course they're in straight lines just to make it look good. They're, they're uh, pretty forgiving, Although I hesitate to say that with too much emphasis because while willows can be slightly mismanaged and you can get away with it, poplars less so. So they can be stored in water and troughs for several weeks, willows maybe longer, and no roots, no leaves, they just sit there and wait until they're ready to be planted. So that is one of the reasons why they're so versatile in country like this. Yes, I know they're not growing yet, but... <laughs> They did soon afterwards. So they're easy to grow. They can be grown, planted amongst livestock. There they are, amongst cattle. I can assure you that almost all of those are still there. And with that particular Dynex product that's protecting the poles, there is very little risk of loss. And I certainly acknowledge that there is a lot of hard work that goes into planting three metre poles out on the hillsides. I've mentioned the fact that they can be planted amongst livestock and I'll just add to that that they are one of those species where grass will grow up to the base provided they're not planted too closely and that they, there's a certain amount of management goes on. So they're, they're ideal for a grazed environment. They're not necessarily the perfect tree. I mean, wouldn't it be great if they fixed nitrogen? Wouldn't it be great if they grew apples? You know, clearly they don't do all those things but they're the best we've got at the moment for a grey situation. <coughs> Excuse me. So they were primarily put out there for soil conservation and erosion control. And for this part of the country where there's some quite extreme erosion, willows in particular are ideal. Shelter and shade is one of those aspects that farmers are very keen on, uh, more so than in the past. And we have seen a situation this, this very summer where drought fodder has been highly valued. 
Any photo you see with, of a well-planted farm looks good, and Bruce has shown us some of those pictures. Very satisfying to see the results 20, 30 years later. And there's some timber potential, and certainly bees with willows, as we'll talk about. So you might recognise that farm, that's Graham Williams up the coast. Graham is the recipient of two awards in this year's Balanced Farm Environment Awards for the East Coast. So he's, um, he's been well rewarded for him and his father's work prior to that. I think he said he planted 50,000 poles on that place. And he manages those poles as well, those trees. Surrounded by forestry, almost. I don't think the farm in the background is his, but clearly there is, he's got something going on there that beats both farming on its own and erosion country and forestry on its own. That's also his place, and there is an example of fodder from willow. It's not a drought at this particular time, but you can see that it's some time since that was harvested. There's a year or two's growth back on those trees. Willows, of all trees, need management. And um, it's quite clear that when you come across a farm that's been planted in willows many years ago, you'll see quite a mess if they haven't been thinned and, uh, or pruned. I think our biggest mistake in the years gone by, when we, all we really had was willows, um, were we planted too many of them. This has allowed the number to, to the population to stay higher and give Graham a lot of flexibility with feeding his livestock, particularly in droughts. Poplar can be used for timber. Now, it tends to be just the enthusiasts that do this, but I've got half a shed full of the stuff, and I'll tell you what, I love it. It's great to handle. It's easy to nail. Um, you, you would have to be reasonably careful with construction. I, don't, I know it's very good for framing. I don't know about a full construction of a, of a building. But this is Riverina Station, back down in Wairau, and they've built the floor, the shearing board, and all that uh, front piece there with the, the doors and the... Um, the rest of the shearing board out of poplar. I don't know that that was treated, but it can be treated with care. Now, this is not my list. This has come from the good old DSIR way back in 1990, and uh, someone was asking about the flowering dates when it's been mentioned today. There's the list. Uh, don't ask me to identify all of those trees, but I do, I do know a bit about the um, first one, the Salix medemii, which I call the Egyptian willow. Uh, Matsudana, now while I'm thinking of it, Matsudana, I believe the Matsudana poles that we grow and use now, the pure species, actually came from this, this, this property and that was imported for here and we still use that. It's one of only two pure species that we actually plant readily. Uh, Hiwanui is, an al is a um, hybrid that we use a little. It's more available here than down in Hawke's Bay. Uh, Viminalis is a shrub. And same with Booth, Tongoya is widely used as a pole. And that bottom one, I'm afraid to say I don't know much about it, but it, look at the flowering dates. It's just phenomenal. So it's really good to hear that Linda's doing this work relating to what the value of each of these is because that's just something we don't, don't understand. You know, do you need one of each or do you need ten of one and one of another? We don't know. Um, I would have to say that about four years ago, as I worked for the Regional Council, <laughs> and I'm not involved in the engineering side of things, but, but our engineering part, department has been doing some clearing of willows and waterways around the Wara area, and a beekeeper came to me very upset about all these willows being cleared, because they'd obviously been crossbreeding and hybridising as they do, and he had lost a huge amount of potential for, um, for nectar and pollen. I had never thought of that, I had no idea. But, but I had to say that in, 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 in defence of the council at the time, and, and we're still doing this work, is these waterways were silting up and they were a flood hazard. Really where willows belong, in my belief, is in the badly eroding gullies. I'd be careful about planting it anywhere else because really you've got poplars who, which are much more useful for grazed areas. Now I've just stuck to four varieties here and in fact I'll only talk about the first three. Unanensis is again another species. The others are all clones. Kawa and Crozes were bred in New Zealand. And Veronese is an Italian variety. I'll stick with those because those top three give us the full range of 
uses in the landscape you want, might need. Mm -hmm. Crow's nest is, is really tough. Veronese is close behind, but much more widely usable in different climate zones. And cow needs lots of moisture, but it looks great. It's a very attractive tree. And it's, um, we'll go through them in a minute. And Unanensis is a Chinese poplar. It's one that looks good too. And a lot of people will find it's, um, it gives enough appeal that they want to plant it readily. That's two trees side by side on the Fraser Town Road in Uwara, and it's Kawa. Um, it's a similar attractive leaf to the Unanensis, and it has a very late leaf fall. How do you know if you've got Kawa? If you're not sure, when all the leaves of the poplars are falling, they've still got theirs, and they keep them for an extra two or three weeks. That's generally how you tell. It could have been the Yunnan as well, but the, the Yunnan has got a very, very shiny, dark green leaf, whereas this is not quite the same. As I said, it needs a deep, moist soil. Its uh, main attributes are that it's possum resistant and it looks good. If you were keen on timber, then you would plant, prefer preferably plant cowl. That's the same two trees in the autumn, and you'll notice this year, particularly on the east coast, just what good colours we have this autumn. That's some years ago, but, but I, I believe it's because of the long dry season we've had and lack of disease. You know, the rust hasn't got to the leaves before the autumn uh, temperatures have, so we've been blessed with some pretty good colours around. And that's, you know, <coughs> a hillside of that spectacular, you've got to admit that. Veronese. Now, this is the best I could get, actually, because the, this is actually at my place. And um, the one on the right is the Veronese. The two to the left are the old Tasman poplar. If you know anything about them at all, they um, were one of the first rust-resistant varieties um, bred in New Zealand. The Veronese, in that particular site, which is very good deep soil, hasn't grown quite or almost as, it's grown almost as fast as the, as the Tasman. But up on the hills, it would be way ahead, streets ahead. It's got a lot more branches, it's a little more upright, and it's a lot tidier tree than those, than those Tasmans. Just take a note of that one to the right, uh, sorry, to the left, that's, that's also crow's nest. It, it's got a fairly tall, straight shape but it could be a lot better than that, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Veronese is a very fast-growing tree. As I said, it's very adaptable. You can just about plant it anywhere. If you're not sure which poplar to grow, you know, I'm talking about poplars here, doesn't mean you can grow it anywhere at all. You've still got to remember it, it's a poplar. Now we're on to Crow's Nest, and this particular property is just one of the first ones you'll see on the right. The first one you see on the right is you're driving to Mahia off the when you turn off at Newhaka. And that property, property there, to the owner's dismay at the time, Will de la Tour, he finally decided he would plant some poles. Unfortunately, the year was 1997, and that was a, another drought. So he declared he would never do it again, but we finally talked him into it. And that, and I went and had a look a couple of years later. He, we gave him a sample of every single variety we had, and the only thing that grew were the crow's nest poplars. Okay, into the willows. And I'll talk about the ones I'm familiar with because, you know, we've really got a good list now of, of poplars and willows that we know we can rely on. If you're really keen to go out, and this isn't a good example, often when I hear or, or um, talk about a new variety, someone says to me, I want the new variety. Every time they want the new variety, don't touch them, unless you're really enthusiastic. Okay? We want to test them first. We want to know that we've got something in our hands that's actually going to do the job. And um, we've got plenty of enthusiasts out there doing that with us. And they're very keen to do it. We're very keen to help them. Don't go and buy 200 of a brand new variety. We've all had our fingers burnt doing that. So Tongoya, Mutri and Hiwanu, they're all Macedonia alba hybrids.
they pretty much all look like that. <laughs> Slightly better light, of course. And they're multi-branched, especially when grown from a pole. So they really do lend themselves either to a form prune, so that you've got a single leader, or regularly cutting them back, so they do that every time. Now I made this wee table up just to give you an idea of what the attributes are. They're not terribly differing between the different varieties. As Bruce mentioned, I think, about the rough bark and the Matsudana, really important, particularly around cattle. They're high density, they're, um, they do have a problem, I should have put it there, that they can be brittle in certain places. I've seen them split in half, and that can be a real menace, but it doesn't happen everywhere, just some farms seem to be prone to it. The two that grow well in higher altitudes are Mutri and Hiwanui. I saw a good example last week where some Tongoya and Mutri were together on a higher altitude farm and they really, the Tongoya had not done well at all. And if you're really keen, lots of spare time, <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> Right, two species that I'm very keen on, and particularly this one, Takasasti. You enthusiasts, I'd really like to see some more work done out there and just, just develop some good systems where a very high protein, very hardy species like this can really be managed and turned into fodder on hard a hill country. Why not? Innovation comes off the farm from what I've seen over the years, but not out of the, not out of the um, science lab. That was one year's growth, by the way. So, I mean, it's almost a miracle tree. It, it, it does incredible things. It just grows in, anywhere except in the wet, wet sites. It does all those things. There it is. That's a shot at my place. Uh, you hate to do it, but they're my pine trees. I didn't plant them, though. <laughs> and they're growing under pine trees, as I believe they do in the Canary Islands. Really tough. I planted those into basically powder. You know what it's like under a pine tree. And every single one grew. Profuse flowering. Rubinia, that's the other species I'm very keen on and believe that we've got some work to do here. There they are growing on a relatively tough site, or the higher ones are. Um, they're exposed, and I know they can be brittle, but they've done all right there. Why aren't we planting more of those on our steep hill country? And when you coppice them, what do they do? They grow straight. But everyone says, oh no, they're crooked. It's because they haven't been coppiced and managed. And it seems that, um, sorry, Robert, you were talking about doing selection. There is very likely to be gene pools in our country already that we can select from and get better growth, better form, and do something with them. So I'd like to challenge somebody out there to, to do some, something with these and, and, and sustain the land, give shade and shelter for your stock, some bee fodder, and make the place look really good. They have to be one of the best looking trees out on the hills, I reckon. Now, I'm not saying, saying there's anything wrong with the Manuka and Kaduka, of course, but, but my belief is that a variety of land uses on a single property is really the way of the future. And, and part of that will be partnerships between people with good ideas, investment money, putting business ventures together with landowners. I really see that the way of the future for all types of outcomes. And here we are talking about bees, and that could well be one of them. Okay, that's me.